what? No rhubarb? I mean, this is crazy. There goes my whole weekend. So a woman actually said this to me in the winter of 1992. And in 1992, the idea of planning a weekend around rhubarb was crazy. But in 2014, it's not so crazy anymore because we can get rhubarb in the winter and pretty much all year round. And we can get a lot of things that we weren't able to get back in 1992 today. And it's because of the demand of us as consumers and, that, and the pressure that we put on the market to get those things. So we've really come a long way. And we've made strides in a lot of the areas that we find important as consumers in what we're looking for in fresh produce. And it wasn't so long ago, we weren't even able to get fresh produce to certain parts of the country. And today, that issue isn't really as prevalent as it was back in the 50s. And now we have things like local that we really care about. And food safety is, is, is a big issue today, and we're able to deal with that in a much quicker way because of the technology around communication. And we're always concerned about price of food. And today we want year-round availability. We want it 365 days a year, everything. And we're really pushing for organic, and organic has become a huge part of the industry today. And we want our food to last. We want it to have legs, as we say in the industry. And of course, we want it to taste good. So we want it all. But today, we're at a turning point, because the world is changing. And our food systems are in peril again. And we have to re-examine what we want of our, out of our food system and what we want in our produce markets. And we have to reevaluate all the priorities about our food. You know, there's a catastrophic drought going on in California, and this slide shows you how it's changed over just the last 10 years. And there's absolutely no groundwater, and it's directly affecting our ability to get fresh produce all around the country. The whole country depends on California for 40% of our fresh produce. Today, in my store this morning, we had no strawberries. We don't have any strawberries all weekend because of the drought. So we really need to reevaluate our priorities with what we want out of our food system. But I want to talk about one part of our food system that is the one part that we in the industry can't really measure on spreadsheets, and we can't really tell uh, what's going on with consumers and how they're buying, because it's the thing that has to happen on our tongue, right? And that's taste. So this guy in the picture here, his name is Michael Rosine. He started a company here in Massachusetts called Red Tomato. And what he wanted to do was find a way to get a red, tasty tomato back into stores, because he had seen the tomatoes were rock hard little pink things that had no flavor. And what he used to do was he'd take a baseball bat when he gave talks about his company and he would hit that tomato that he got a, at a conventional supermarket with the bat and it would retain its shape. <laughs> and the reason it retained that shape is because it had no water in the cell walls and that water in the cell walls directly relates to the flavor of that tomato. And so we want tomatoes all year round now but in order to get tomatoes all year round, we have to get them from places like Mexico and California and Canada and Florida, which, by the way, is the worst place in the world to grow tomatoes. But we have to put them on a truck and send them across the country. And we have to get them received into a distribution center, which sends them out to stores. And it's at that loading dock in that distribution center that is one of the most crucial parts of our food system. Because there an inspector is looking at that produce and he's going to reject it if he doesn't like what he sees. And with tomatoes, they have to be hard or firm to get past that inspector and get received. Or if they're soft at all and taste good, they're going to get rejected. So we've really made a compromise in the what we want out of our tomato for year-round availability. But let's talk about something that we here in New England can be really proud of that we know is going to taste good. And that's our apples, right? We love our Macintosh and Macallan in Cortland. And, you know, Ma New England has such a history with apples. And Johnny Appleseed is from Lemonster, Massachusetts, you know. So we want, so let's say we want 
we know it's going to taste good, but now we want an organic local apple, right? I get that all the time. Where are the local organic apples? Well, we in a, convent, in a supermarket can't really get organic apples, and that's because of humidity and pests that exist here in New England that don't exist in California or the West Coast. And the pressures that those things put on the orchards make it really risky and really not a good idea to try organic, method, organic methods for growing apples or actually any tree fruit in this part of the world in the Northeast. So luckily, our friends at Red Tomato come into play again, and they developed this program called ECO. And what ECO does is they work with scientists here at like Cornell and UMass and other major universities that have ag departments, and they developed this growing protocol to help growers figure out what the pressures are on their farm, how to deal with it in the most acute way so that they minimize the use of spray and then minimize the use of pesticides. And what you get is the cleanest, tastiest apple you can get on the East Coast. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I think East Coast apples are way better than West Coast apples. And I will buy an eco apple over an organic apple from the West Coast every single day. And so I've made a choice and we all make choices and we all make compromises in the decisions based on what's really important to us in our food. And it's really in those compromises that we have to be educated about our food and try to, try to get ourselves to that next level of conversation because it's not as black and white as conventional versus organic. It's not as black and white as local because, and non-local because we can't get local stuff here all the time. We don't have that long a growing season, right? So maybe we need to think regionally about our food, and we need to think down the East Coast into New Jersey and Virginia and Georgia and Florida and be proud of the fact that we're buying food from those areas. And we need to, like, educate our children about our food. You know, we've, we've eliminated food education from our lives somehow because we went from a, a gregarian society that kids went out and worked in the farm, and then they went to school, and they learned about the farm, and they learned about their food back then, but now we don't really have that built into our curriculum in schools. And we need to really just raise the whole level of a conversation about our food and take our knowledge and our dollars and spend it in the way that will drive the market to get us to that sustainable, that next sustainable level to take us down the road for the generations after us. And so at the end of this all, we really need to think about do we really want to plant a weekend around rhubarb in January? 